Hello, I'm Reverend Dr. William J. Barber II, co-chair of the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival. And I'm here with my esteemed co-chair, the Reverend Dr. Liz Theo Harris, and the whole host of the Poor People's Campaign across the nation, but specifically tonight in Texas. Oh, we love Texas, and we love the Poor People's Campaign in Texas. Now, we've been doing these Senate town halls, North Carolina, Mississippi, we are, are, are all over the country, because, Kentucky, because we understand that in an election, the, the race for the Senate is critical, particularly when it comes to the policies that impact poor and low wealth people. We understand that the Senate, the Senate is the place where bills can either live or die in the Senate. We also have uh, know that there's when it comes to the United States Senate, that you have the power to confirm judges, the power, the power on the federal level and on the Supreme Court level, which lasts for a lifetime. I mean, think about that. A hundred people have the power to give somebody power over our judicial system for their entire life, their entire life. That is an enormous amount of power. Some say the, 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 one, the body of this world of the 100 most powerful political people in this world. That we also understand that in the South, too often people have said the South is one way. Some people say it's red. Some people say it's conservative. Some people say it's this or that. But our research says mostly what it is is unorganized because the reality is we've done a study and that recent study said if poor and low wealth people in the South voted at the same level as those that make $50,000 and above, and if poor and low wealth people of every race, creed and color, particularly black and white and Latino, would join together around an agenda and support candidates that are about their agenda, they could fundamentally change the entire United States Senate. Isn't that something? In fact, it, the study we did just said that 15 states are between one and 19% could change. 1% in uh, Michigan, 19% in North Carolina, somewhere between 10 and 11% in Texas. And, and, and wait, Texas? Yeah, our study actually shows that poor and low wealth people organized around an agenda and voting could fundamentally shift North Carolina and Georgia and Florida and Texas. Yes, Southern states that are often not talked about in this vein. Poor and low wealth people coming together across lines of race and color and creed and class uh, and, and, excuse me, and sexuality have the power to do this. And one of the ways that that has to happen is we have to talk honestly about the pain and the poverty, but then also show the power. And the Poor People's Campaign in Texas is no joke. They are none to be played with. 
They are organizing all across Texas because they see what is possible. Doesn't matter to them what the commentators on TV say and what the news people say. They say the South will not be forgotten. And Texas will not be the last one again to figure out that freedom has come. Oh, no, it won't be a two years anymore. It won't be a Juneteenth. We don't let it be known right now that freedom and liberation and political power is possible right now, right now. Not, not the next election, but right now. So that's why we've had these Senate town halls. Now, we invite both sides of the aisle and we tell on the side it doesn't come. So you'll hear about that in a minute. But it's not that they didn't get an invite. They got an invite but they didn't want to come, but we invite those who, who, who come to come. The media is on. We'll have thousands of people online from all over Texas, and then those thousands of people can cross post and, and push this out even further. And so even before we get started, we want a video to kind of shape how serious this is. It is serious business, especially when we have a time now where some people are running for office and in your face, and this is not partisan, this is just what's happening. They literally are saying, vote for me, I'll take your health care and let you die. Vote for me, I'll block your living wages. Vote for me, and I'll poison the environment. Isn't that something that people have the gall to say that? And we have the right. You can vote for them if you want to. I mean, you literally have that right to do it. But at least we ought to know where people stand on the critical issues. And so there's pain and poverty video coming up now that shows this connection and intersectionality across the board. And then the Reverend Dr. Liz Theo Harris is going to come with my mom. And then I'm going to introduce Jennifer after that. Not that, let me do it now. You just come on after Reverend Liz, who is a member of the Texas Poor People's Campaign Steering Committee. We just found out we might be distant cousins or something. I don't know. We just found out we got a whole lot of connection. And that's a cool thing in times like these. But she's with the Texas Poor People's Campaign. She's going to come on for a minute or so and greet us. And then we're going to hear a five-minute statement from Miss... M.J. Hagar, is that right? M.J., I like that, M.J., who's running for the United States Senate from the state of Texas, the state of Texas. But first, let's see what it looks like out here, for real, for real, even before COVID, and why we can't be quiet or silent or inactive anymore. I worked 41 years in the coal mines. I have black lung, and it's just unfathomable what these poor coal miners That's right. have to go through in order to get what they have worked for and deserve. At one time, poverty was a temporary condition. You were on a down slope for a minute, but you could bounce back up. We can't bounce back up today. It's permanent. We're not going back to the factory and building cars and trucks like we once did. A job working at McDonald's or the grocery store doesn't pay enough for one person to live. We work a 40-hour work week. Still not enough. Living from paycheck to paycheck. Rent is $600 a month. We got water bill, electricity. I do this for my kids. And it, and it hurts. I'm 46 years old. I've lived in poverty here in West Virginia every day of my life. And I'm working. I am working poor with a bachelor's degree. I'm doing the best I can with what I have. We were in the height of mass water shutoffs. This entire neighborhood um, was shut off all at one time. I saw all my neighbors get shut off right in front of me. It was kind of terrifying. I'm 42 years old, and I'm a cashier at McDonald's. I had lost my house. You're welcome to come inside. There's a lot of people that are living in their cars. You never notice until you're in the same situation. I don't have stuff to give my children. I'm paying all these bills, and they need school clothes and stuff. They be asking me for I can't get some. Now I'm a Kansas farmer's wife. Kansas farmers are committing suicide. Why? They're usually in debt up to their eyeballs. I see poverty in my own community. You know, there's a 70% unemployment rate in my in the reservation right now. Here in New York City, we're home to millionaires and billionaires, and we have so many people living in the street, and that's just not right. I've been a homeless veteran twice. I uh, lived in a shelter. I've been living down here since I was 17. My only chance of going to college 
was joining the army. We are demanding that we stop the war on our poor. 700,000 people in this country are on the verge of losing their food stamps. This budget calls for shrinking the social safety net programs like Medicare. I just know that everything that's happening to us isn't right. I'm in stage five of kidney disease. I fell behind on my health care and they canceled my health insurance and they told me uh, I have to wait until open enrollment. There's only five stages of kidney disease and I'm in the fifth stage. Murder, it's murder, you know, if you ask me, it's murder. I lost a son to gun violence. And I lost a daughter. No parents should have, in America, should have to bury their child their ch for a lack of medical expense. I'm willing because my children my God. are no more. My God, my God, Kevin. Well. Well, thanks so much for joining us. As Reverend Barbara said, my name is Reverend Dr. Liz Theo Harris, and I have the honor of being co-chair of the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival. As he said, this is a nonpartisan forum. We send invitations to both candidates for the U.S. Senate from Texas, John Cornyn and M.J. Hager for this program at the same time. We want to thank M.J. Hager for agreeing to join us to respond to the priorities of poor and low-income Texans, which are all too often ignored by politicians, regardless of party. We've repeatedly called, emailed, sent a certified letter to John Cornyn's campaign and have not been able to get a response. But the issues and priorities of poor and low-income Texans are far too urgent to ignore any longer. And so we are pleased that we are holding the Senate Town Hall with MJ Hager. If you're joining us for the first time, the Poor People's Campaign is engaged in a We Must Do More campaign. Um, it's about getting involved, uh, signing up to help protect the vote, unleash the power of poor and low-income voters. For more information, you can go to vote.poorpeoplescampaign.org. And we have the goal of calling and texting more than 2 million poor and low-income voters by election day. We need you to sign up and get involved. If you're part of a faith community or a community organization, you can also make the prophetic pledge and continue mobilizing voters and participating in the text and phone banking, as well as a more faithful month uh, uh, kind of observance that we're doing. You can also go to find out more about that at vote.poorpeoplescampaign.org. Now I wanna turn it over to um, our leaders from Texas who are gonna welcome us to this town hall and I thank everyone for, for joining us this evening. And just before Ms. Winbush comes, Liz, I forgot to mention it. You brought it up, but thank you for bringing it We're calling 2 million people, and people should know hundreds of thousands of those are being Texas, because Texas is one of those eight states, one of those 10 states that we're focused on. So people ought to know that, and they can join in. If you're listening in on this call tonight, you can join in and continue to sign up. Thanks, Liz, for, for saying that and reminding us. Yeah, that's a huge effort. It's never been done before. Not, not this way, uh, to really call on poor and low people to be engaged. Jennifer, Sister Winbush. Yes, good evening. A special thanks to everyone for being here tonight. I'm Jennifer Winbush of the Steering Committee of the Texas Poor People's Campaign. We are here tonight because we have to be heard. Did you know or have you thought about as we sit here tonight, there are 12.6 million people that are poor or low income in Texas. That's 44% of our population. Can you think about that since July, more than 3.9 million renters are at risk of being evicted and 9.9 .9 million uh, because of this crisis are in a situation where they could lose or have lost their income. 
We're in a situation where we have in Texas critical people on the front lines who are afraid because they don't have the PPE that they need that they could go take the COVID home. We are a state that is sickening tired of being tired. The Texas Poor People's Campaign has been diligently registering people to vote across six regions in our state. This is often some work that we must all do, not often, it is work we must all do because we know a change will come only when we get out, get tired, our voices are heard, and we demand certain things. On behalf of the Texas campaign, we want to thank all of our guests for being here. Welcome to Texas if you're not from Texas, and for sharing and talking and being with us tonight. Thank you very much. In Texas, in Texas, we are 12 million. Did y'all hear that? 12 million. That's not some drop in the bucket. 12 million people are poor and low wealth. In this country, we are 140 million. 43% of the nation, 42% of the states mm -hmm. in Texas. You can't ignore that. Not, not, you can't ignore that. That's power. It's a grotesque number. But if you flip it over, it's also a lot of power. And then we know that in addition to that, we are 64 million in this country, poor and low wealth people who right now are already eligible to vote. Don't have to do anything else. They're already eligible. 34 million didn't vote last time, 29 million did. And, and, and Sister Hager, as you come, we did we did a study with Columbia University. Here are the top three reasons people didn't vote were poor and low wealth. First one is they don't hear anybody talking about them. That's the number one reason. <laughs> they say politicians don't talk about us. Even though we're 140 million people, even though we're 12 million strong in, 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 in Texas, we hit a middle class, we hit a wealth. The second reason is they can't get off jobs because the majority of poor people are white women and working. White women and working. The majority of poor people are white women and work. They just work for less than a living wage. And then that's why it's poor and low wealth. They can't get off jobs. They don't have transportation. And then the third reason is voter suppression. Racist voter suppression. It's targeted at black and brown people, but ends up and, and, and Latino people and indigenous people, but ends up hurting all people, even women. I don't have time to do it tonight, but we did a study one time on the way in which photo ID is targeted at black people, but it ends up hurting about 40% of white women too. And we've been under these illusions that have not allowed us to look past these trick this trickery and see how really what happens is this trickery of racism and classism is simply used to elect power, to put people in power who are more concerned about make, treating corporations like people and people like things. But you chose to come on tonight. You chose as a, a candidate for the Senate. And I'm not going to ignore 12 million people in my state and 140 million people in my country. And for that alone, we thank you for coming on. We wish Brother Corn and had, but we just got to tell him he wouldn't come on. He wouldn't come on. Let me say that one more time. He wouldn't come on. 12 million people in his, in his state, we wouldn't come on. Poor people's campaign is made up of everybody, black and white and brown and gay and straight, we wouldn't come on. That's all right, but you came on. And so we turn it over to you now for five minutes. Rob, after she finishes, because you know the people who didn't come and who did come, and you are, you are always ready to go, I want you to lead in calling on the people for their questions and their comments. Will you take that over? Thank you so much. Ms. Hager. Yes, sir. Thank you. You're not alone. He has uh, canceled or declined on multiple things. Um, but, uh, but, but definitely, um, we are used to our pleas falling on deaf ears, but that doesn't mean we have to put up with it anymore uh, here in Texas. So thank you, everybody, for being here today and for all of the hard work that y'all are doing to fight for regular, hardworking, everyday people. Here in Texas, we're juggling three minimum wage jobs at a time sometimes to end, make ends meet. That's how I was raised. My mom had work in three jobs, you know. Uh, for those facing poverty, especially during this economic crisis that's put millions of Texans and Americans out of work, I'm grateful for the work that y'all are doing. Um, for those that may not know me, I grew up in, in very rural Republican Texas. 
Um, and uh, I, I was also, I kind of grew up a little bit like a low information voter and a little apathetic and, and feeling like nobody was talking about the issues that were important to me and my family. And, and I, I hear you when you say that. Um, and then I, uh, I spent 12 years in the military, five years working in healthcare. And I think that's the kind of experience that's really important that we send to DC. Um, I spent two years working in tech and I, I got both an undergraduate and my executive MBA through UT Austin. Um, through the military. So um, that's a little bit about me. You know, I have worked minimum wage jobs. I've waited tables. I've been laid off um, right after I had my first kiddo. I've worried about where I'm going to get my health care from. I've worried about whether or not Social Security will be there for me. And right now, I just don't see a lot of politicians in D.C. who understand the challenges that they've been charged with finding solutions to. So I'm not sure why we're surprised when they fail. Um, but I'm running for Senate because I took an oath to support and defend our Constitution when I put on the uniform. And I don't believe I've been relieved from that oath because I no longer wear the uniform, uh, but also because of my ardent desire to protect the world that my two young boys and all of our kids are growing up into, into this country. This country that is known for the American dream is supposed to be offering people opportunity to be able to work hard to better their circumstances. And, and I'm, I'm cognizant of the world that they're going to inherit from us. Um, we need to fight to ensure that Texas is a place where regardless of where you were born or how much money your family has, people have equal opportunity to build good lives and build that generational wealth for their families and, and better their circumstances. And, and, and I'm committed to uplifting the voices of Texans on the front lines of the economic crisis and our, our, our frontline workers that are being asked to risk their lives to keep our world and our country moving forward and keep grocery shelves stocked. Um, we have a real opportunity this election to shift the gears of power away from the ultra wealthy special interests toward regular everyday Texans. I've been to every corner of this great state and I'm here to tell y'all this is the year we're gonna take this state back from the bootlickers and give it back to the fighters because that's who we are in Texas. He has big corporate donors and PACs on his side. I am endorsed by End Citizens United because I am committed to getting corporate PAC money out of politics. It's a big part of the dysfunction and the reason why they can't get anything done. Um, there are some very powerful people trying to stop us. Let's be very clear. John Cornyn is their lapdog and their lackey, and they want him right where he is, protecting their profit margins and their bottom line. And and I can understand why he'd be afraid to come on this forum and answer these direct questions because, frankly, he can't answer them because he hasn't been fighting for us. And it's very clear. Um, you know, these powerful people are donating millions to his campaign from the insurance industry, big pharma, the private detention centers, the gun lobby. Um, but guess what? They're not that powerful because there are more of us than there are of them. And when we realize that, there is so much power in that. When we stand together, there is nothing they can do to stop us. And that's what's got them so scared. If we all focus on the mission in front of us, if we keep organizing in our communities, if we refuse to be silenced, if we make sure everyone goes and votes and brings five friends with them to the polls and just vote, vote, vote and overcome that voter suppression, Texas has just been named the most restrictive voting state in the country. If we can do that, if we can keep focused and keep working, we're going to win this. And we're going to elect servant leaders up and down the ballot who are fighting for regular hardworking folks like us. I'm telling y'all, we need to elect people who can commit to bringing the voices of regular people to D.C. instead of acting like they're going to go to D.C. and speak for us and, and, and have the ego to think that they're going to come up with all the solutions on themselves. We've got to be having conversations like these we're having tonight so that we can voice the solutions and our leaders can take those solutions to D.C. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Hagar, for that opening statement. Uh, we're now going to hear from Werner Mancia, who is a student, a student at Houston Community College. Uh, he will uh, ask, he will give his, he'll introduce himself in English and Spanish, and then also ask the question in English and Spanish. Werner, if you would come off mute um, when you, and uh, introduce yourself. I think you're good. Yeah, my name is Warner, um, a Spanish. Durante esta época del COVID-19, mi padre, que es un hombre uh, hábil, 
no consiguió tanto trabajo como antes. La gente de, deja de necesitarlo para trabajar. Así que entre menos dinero en nuestra casa para pagar las cuentas. Con el cierre de la escuela perdí mi trabajo de estudio. Esto también fue un golpe para mi familia porque nuevamente significó menos dinero entrando en la casa. Mi madre ya no trabaja porque tiene que quedarse en casa con mi hermana que tiene 11 años y está haciendo aprendizaje virtual. Mi familia ha tenido que, que gastar sus ahorros, facturas para mantener al día. Todos los miembros uh, en mi familia estamos muy estresados porque no está seguro de cómo pagar las facturas. En Texas, además de, dos, de los 12 millones de personas pobres y de baja ingreso, hay 4 millones de personas que carecen de seguro médico y 5.3 millones ganan menos de 15 por hora. ¿Cómo va a abor abordar su campaña específicamente a estos problemas de pobreza, seguridad, atención médica y salario digno? ¿Y cómo desafiará el mito de la escasez que afirma que no hay suficiente para que todos prosperen en nuestro estado. Okay, my name is Warner Mancia. During this time of COVID-19, my father, who is a handyman, did not get as much as work his previously had. People start needing him to work, so he has less money coming into our home to pay bills. With the close closure of a school, I lost my work study job. This was a, also a blow to my family because again, it means less money to come in, into the home. My father is a longer working because she has to, to stay uh, at home with my sister who is 11 and doing virtual learning. My family has to spend their saving and bills to keep it up. There is a lot of stress on everyone in my family because they're not sure about how bills will be paid. In Texas, in addition to the 12.6 million poor and low income people, there are 4.9 million people who will lack health insurance and 5.3 million make less than 15 per hour. How your campaign going to address those issues on poverty, equity, healthcare, and living wage? And how will you change the math that there is not enough for everyone? So Warner, thank you for your question. This is really important. This idea that somehow if we expand opportunity and, and enable people to have better lives. It's somehow reducing the size of the pie for those who have more, it's, it's, it is a myth. And I think that we need to make sure that we elect people who have faced our challenges, not only because I think we're more effective at finding solutions to those challenges, but because we understand the, the economic truth that regular hardworking people are actually the backbone of our economy. This is the right thing to do to, to fight hard for living wages and to, to incrementally increase the minimum wage. And, and we have to do this responsibly in, in partnership with small businesses and everything. But I mean, if you go back to the time in our economy when we were the strongest in our history, and then you take that minimum wage and you adjust it for inflation, it's actually much higher than $15 an hour. So we are, we are hobbling our own economy when we are not enabling the hardworking middle class of this and, and lower, you know, economic status groups to be able to have the income that it takes to keep food on the table and keep a roof over their heads. You know, we, we have Republicans that want to demonize the programs that are providing people a social safety net, but they don't understand that their policies are increasing the number of people who need that type of help because they're just fighting to line the pockets of their corporate special interests. So, you know, 
I think we need to fight harder for union rights. Um, I lost my dad to a workplace accident. I lost my job in the military by fighting for workers' rights. I think that states that have stronger unions and rights to organize look out for working people and give us an opportunity to, to organize and to um, you know, be able to fight for ourselves. But also they expand jobs, they expand access to vocational training and apprenticeship programs. And, and I, I just think that that's a big key. So fighting for a higher wage, um, fighting for union rights, but also we don't talk enough about reducing the cost of living. And there's a lot we can do in housing to reduce the cost of living, but I only have less than two minutes left. So I, I have to address the other thing you said, which was healthcare. Um, we had a healthcare crisis in this country before COVID. And the broken healthcare system and the high number of people without care is why we can't get the pandemic under control in Texas. Um, I worked in healthcare for five years. And like I mentioned, I got laid off. Um, and the high number of people without access to care is not only egregious and, and it, it is a human right to have access to care, but because of the high number of people who can't pay because they're not covered, we're spreading costs in the highest possible cost setting, the emergency rooms and the urgent care and so the costs that people are paying now are so, I mean, I, it took me like two years to pay off having one of my kiddos and I, I thought we had good insurance. So there's a lot that's happening that we can fight for. We need to fight for a public option, I believe, because um, I believe that the, the best care I ever got um, was when I had access to TRICARE, which is something that they give to the military when you're not near a military base that has military medical care. Um, which, by the way, military medical care is the single provider government run type health care that John Cornyn is trying to, to, to scare people about. I am not advocating for that. I have had no choice in my health care before, and I will never allow that to happen to Texans on my watch. Um, I believe we need access to a public option like military track care, which is basically like military me Medicare, um, because that provides us access to care. It provides people a way to, if they want to start a small business, they can quit their job and, and be entrepreneurs. It, it provides people, um, you know, in times now, like we have a record unemployment, um, but it still preserves choice. And so there's a lot more I want to say on this, but I'm out of time. So there's a lot we can do, but, but thank you, Werner, for your question and for lifting up this issue. Thank you for answering. Thank, thank, thank you, Ms. Hagar. And I want to thank you for something you just did. You may not realize that you did it. You've been one of the first candidates to say, look, we had a crisis before COVID. Mm -hmm. And I think the worst thing to do is people say, things got so bad after COVID. No, things got worse. Yeah. It's not like people got poor or poor low up after COVID. They didn't have health care uh, after COVID. That's, that's the problem. Imagine mm -hmm. what the world would be like if we had had living wages and health care for everybody prior to COVID. That, that's really a question. The second thing that you you just said, which was which, which is important, is the, the fact that if you actually index this thing based on inflation from the time the first uh, poverty um, measurement was done, which was actually inadequate at the time, because people were fighting it even then. Uh, you know, we tend to forget that same people, the cousins are the same people that fought Franklin Delano Roosevelt over Social Security. The cousins, their cousins are not fake. <laughs> okay, okay, it's not like it's some new group. But anyway, um, yeah, be over 15. But the other feature is that there's no evidence that if you raise the minimum wage of 15, you're going to lose jobs. Because in fact, what you're going to do is put $398 billion into the economy and immediately remove 49 million people from low wealth, poverty and low wealth. Think about that. With just one policy, you could cut 49 people million people from poverty and low wealth and infuse $368 billion into the economy. You know, that's the kind of analysis we do in the Poor People's Campaign, as Liz likes to say. We don't go out here and holler and scream and not know what we're talking about. You know, we have policies and footnotes because poor and low wealth people deserve that. We got to break through um, these crazy myths. So it's, I think it's, a, it's a, and, and, and I'm, I'm glad that you mentioned that tonight. And then, you know, People like Corn, Corn, I wish he was here. God, I wish he was here because we just love a nonpartisan conversation. And this is a nonpartisan conversation, but it'd be great to have it two ways. Uh, the senators do have a public option. It's called get elected. I mean, you get elected, you get free health care. Pay for it by the public. That's a public option. <laughs> and you get choice with it. Mm -hmm. Now, in fact, you get to choose the best. You get to choose like the Cadillac plan. All you have to do is get elected. That's all you have to do, just get elected. However you want to do it, hook, crook, sneak, cheat, voter suppression, get elected. 
and you get free health care paid for by the people, the top of the line. It's amazing to me that then you don't want your constituencies to have what you have. And then not only that, you get a quick pension. I don't think you have to serve in about two terms to have a have a pension for the rest of your life. One. No, was it one, six years? Mm -hmm. Oh my goodness. Yep. What? John Cornyn is on three taxpayer funded pensions right now that he's currently receiving. He's not worried about social security. Now, now, no. now. I mean, so you don't want to fight people's living wages. You don't want people to have paid sick leave, unemployment, even in Mr. COVID. You get free health care, and all you have to do is serve six years. Just make it. You don't even have to be a good senator for six years. You don't have to pass a doggone piece of legislation. You'd be the worst senator. You can run and not get reelected. But for six years of public service, you get a pension the rest of your life, but then yep. you want to block 12 million poor and low wealth Texans from having the basic set. Somebody ought to say something. And I, we, we're just talking about what we're talking about and raising these issues. Rob? Thank you. Uh, we'll now hear from uh, Marsha Jackson, who is a community activist in uh, the uh, Dallas Fort Worth area. Uh, Ms. Jackson, introduce herself and then ask uh, the second question. Thank you, Rob. Good evening. My name is Marsha Jackson. I'm co chair of Southern Sector Rising and spokesperson for Neighbors United Community in the Florida Florence neighborhood. Neighbors United includes me, my family, my neighbors near Shingle Mountain, the, the 198,000 tons of Shingle Mountain created by Blue Star Recycling. Our lives are feeling the impact of the polluted particles since January 2018. This company began taking in roof and shingles, supposedly recycling, grinding up the shingles to sully for use on roads and highways, which never happened. Shingle Mountain pollutants particles are airborne, which we experience coughing up black mucus from the roof and shingles. These shingles are contaminated and full of fiberglass. Daily, you are, in, you are inhaling fiberglass, inhaling pollutants, taking your breath, affecting your throat, irritation from the fiberglass, and inflaming our vocal cords. The kids can't go outside daily without having to take breathing treatments. Shingle Mountain was created in the black and brown community, allowing this polluter to affect our health frequently. Our call to action will continue, and we will also continue to bring attention to zoning discrimination in black and brown communities. And we know that the attacks on voting rights and voter suppression in Texas is directly tied to communities like mine, building the power to challenge zoning, laws and environmental racism. Inhaling the fiberglass chokes our voices, just like the attempts to suppress our votes. The Karen U.S. Senate has refused to restore the protection of the Voter Rights Act. Voter suppression is on the rise across this country, and what is targeted at Black and Brown communities. It hurts poor white and other communities and undermines our democracy. How are you addressing voter suppression and what are your policy commitments if you are elected? Thank you so much, Marsha, for asking this question. Um, and I, 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 you know, I also want to talk about environmental racism, <laughs> but but the questions of voter suppression. So let's start there and and say that um, you know the bishop mentioned earlier um, people not being able to get t time off work to to be able to go vote. And and when I'm talking. Um, to some well-intended people, they want to really get behind making um, Election Day a holiday. And, and I got to tell you, I support that. But having worked in the type of jobs that don't work bankers hours, I know that having Election Day as a holiday isn't going to mean much to a lot of the people that we're talking about who, who don't actually get holidays off from work, um, people waiting tables and, and things like that. So um, there's so much that we need to do. Texas was just cited as the state with the most restrictive voting in the country. I knew we had bad voter suppression in, in Texas. I didn't realize it was the worst in the country. Um, and so, you know, I've been very passionate about the things that we need to do. We need to, first of all, from the Senate, what we can do is um, call it the John Lewis Voting Rights Act and, and vote for it. <laughs> There's a lot in Mitch McConnell's legislative graveyard that could be helping people, right? But we got to get the Senate back up and running again where we're actually passing bills. Um, I think there's something like 500 and over 500 bills sitting on Mitch McConnell's desk that haven't gotten a, a vote. But um, there's, you know, right now in Texas, we have 
Um, you have to register 30 days ahead of time. A lot of states have online registration. A lot of days have same day registration. Um, there are people getting their ballots rejected for uh, a signature being wrong or, or not looking the same or something like that. It's like uh, sometimes there's little data discrepancies and they are under no obligation to notify us. Um, we're one of only six states that hasn't relaxed restrictions for vote by mail um, in the middle of a pandemic. So there's a lot that we need to do and we need to recognize that this um, does disproportionately impact communities of color. Um, for example, black residents of entirely black neighborhoods waited 29% longer to vote and were 74% more likely to spend more than 30 minutes at their polling place relative to entirely white neighborhoods. Um, so this is a real crisis. It is intended to target communities of color and, and um, you know, poor communities. And um, I think that there's a lot that we can do, but step one is electing people who recognize that our democracy is healthier, the more people who take part. And, and we need to single out elected officials who are clearly afraid of being held accountable for their failures and being voted out. Um, whether that means, you know, counting for the census or voting suppression, we have to end gerrymandering. It's a little bit of a cart before the horse situation because we have to win these races in order to end the voter suppression. Um, so I think we just have to outwork them right now and, and flip our state house, which is where a lot of the voter suppression comes from. We need to elect good people up and down the ballot. We need to get our judiciary back to a place where it's objective and unbiased. It's, it's becoming more and more partisan. And a lot of these battles are gonna be lost in the judiciary. Um, so there are people on the ballot for the Texas Supreme Court and, and other judicial um, races. I'm going to encourage everybody to, I know everyone has a full plate, has a lot going on, trying to keep food on the table. I'm with you on that. Um, but go and do a little bit of research of the people that are on your ballot, um, because not everybody has a, a, a political party by their name. Um, but, but focus on those down ballot races I'm too. The lower down the ballot the race is, the, 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 the higher uh, direct impact to your life that race has, and the more likely you are to have less information about that person lower on the ballot. So please do that. Um, so, you know, we have to elect people who are not afraid that more people are going to vote. We have to elect people who want a democracy in, where, in which more people are, are, are participating. And if you are planning on going and serving your own self-interest, then you want as few people voting as possible. If you are planning on going and fighting for people, you want as many people voting as possible. And that's who we need to seek out and support. May I ask one follow-up to that before Reverend Liz comes with the um, final questions? I think, Rob, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, she'll come with the final questions and we're running at 45 minutes now. Okay. MJ, there are, if you don't mind me calling you MJ. Oh, please um, do, sir. There are today, I'm gonna give you a number, 2,677. I give that number to every person running for the Senate, 2,677. And then I give them this number, 24 hours. 24 hours is the length of time that Strom Thurmond blocked the Civil Rights Act of 57. He filibustered it. 2,666 days of the number of days Mitch McConnell has refused to pass the Voting Rights Act and even allow a vote mm -hmm. since June 25th, 2013, when the five members of the Supreme Court gutted it and Ruth Bader Ginsburg said it was like taking off and um, putting down an umbrella in Mr. a rainstorm, which then allows like the Texas, Texas legislature to pass bills they get implemented before they're um, blocked by the Department of Justice. Where are you standing on fixing uh, the Voting Rights Act, of which Texas was once covered under that Voting Rights Act in Section 5 until uh, June 25th, 2013? Yeah, I stand firmly in absolute demanding that we pass the John Lewis Voting Rights Act. Absolutely supportive. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Uh, now we'll have Reverend Dr. Liz Theo Harris, who will um, ask the, uh, the next question. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, so this next question is, is about the pandemic. Uh, what we're, we all are very aware and, and have even spoken to it this evening that the, we're in the midst of a pandemic that has exposed the fissures of our society um, fissures including systemic racism and poverty. Uh, you know, 46% of Texas population um, 
close to, um, you know, uh, 10 million people have lost income due to this crisis. 53% of Texas poor and low-income households have experienced a loss of employment income. Uh, more than a million poor and low-income people in Texas have reported that they often or sometimes don't have enough food to, to eat. And so the, the question is, um, if elected, what will your immediate focus in responding to the needs of essential workers who are often poor and low income workers and other poor communities disproportionately impacted by the pandemic? Yeah, I do everything I can to meet with and lift up the voices of frontline workers as often as I can. Um, I recently just had a, a healthcare uh, frontline worker um, press conference. I think it was two days ago. I was just in the Rio Grande Valley and I'm heading back there this weekend. Um, I worked in healthcare for five years. My father-in-law, who I adore, who uh, is my dad now, um, is, a, is, is an essential worker. And, and I feel a lot when I look at how our essential workers and frontline workers are, are, are being treated, it, it feels like we are asking of them what we ask our men and women in uniform, put yourself on the line, put yourself at risk, do it for your country, keep us, keep us going, keep our economy going, keep, uh, you know, the grocery shelves stocked. Um, but with our men and women in uniform, we have a commitment to keeping them safe and we want to give them the equipment that it takes and the training that it takes and the circumstances that it takes. And, you know, under other administrations, uh, a healthy state department and a healthy foreign policy environment, but we're not doing that for our frontline workers. And we're asking, I mean, I, the healthcare workers I talked to a couple of days ago have to buy their own PPE. And, and you know, John Cornyn's over there fighting for liability protections for negligent corporations that are not protecting people because that's who's propping up his campaign. So, you know, we need First thing we can do is get the pandemic under control, right? Um, that's the best thing we can do for our economy and for our frontline workers. In addition to that, there are so many frontline workers in, coming in contact with a lot of people who can't go and get a COVID test if they're exhibiting symptoms because they don't have access to health insurance and they can't pay for it. It's, it's a perpetuating system and it's why things just keep getting worse. So, you know, I, I think that we need to provide sick leave um, because right now we're, we're not incentivizing people to not spread this virus. Um, we need to pass unemployment insurance extensions that John Cornyn says was a mistake. Um, over the summer, he said he didn't feel any sense of urgency to pass a second stimulus. Look, here's the point, okay? When Mitch McConnell says, um, oh, we're not gonna pass stimulus until after the election. Did anybody else go, oh my God, rent is due on the first? Cause I sure as hell did. And I don't think we have enough people in office who have had that fear, who have said, well, wait a minute, we can't, what do you, what do you mean you're going to wait till after the election? They're playing these political games and they don't understand how it feels to not be able to make your rent or your mortgage or pay your bills. So, you know, I, I think you ask, what, what, what can we do? Um, we need to recognize the places that need help. Um, we need to understand that places like the Rio Grande Valley are dying at four times the rate of our state average. We need to recognize that, um, when people can't get access to testing, that is step one in protecting their families, protecting themselves, getting getting care and not spreading the disease. And people right now can't afford those. Um, so I think this comes from a real place of people like John Cornyn just thinking that we are disposable, just thinking that regular people um, are somehow less than measuring our worth based on our net worth, maybe and, and not. And we see it with family separation and immigration. We, we see it constantly that they are treating people like they are less than and like they don't deserve dignity and they don't deserve to be able to pursue happiness, right? Wasn't our country founded on the inalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness? What happened to that? I'm trying to get our country back to a place where we honor what are supposed to be American values and to get us to a place where we can fulfill our potential as the leaders of the free world and the land of opportunity. We're not doing either of those two things right now. We're not securing opportunity and we're not leading the free world. Thank you so much. And so I have one final question um, and I'm asking that you would answer the question and then also weave in some closing remarks. Um, okay. Uh, and, you know, how, whatever, whatever you choose to say. But the, the final question is, how do you define systemic racism? and what policies in your platform are there to address it? Um, and so we appreciate both um, you being here with us and, and, and answering these questions and, and also um, uh, uh, closing with, with whatever statement you have to all the people that have joined us um, this evening. Thank you so much.
Yes, thank you. Um, I define systemic racism as the institutions that are embedded that have either gotten to the state that they're in because of a history of discrimination um, and racism or um, have um, evolved to a place where they have perpetuated disparities. Things like, so, okay, 90% uh, of minority owned businesses did not get the PPP loans that they were hoping for. John Cornyn recently from the Senate floor and then again had the gall to repeat it on the debate stage with me, said he didn't think system systemic racism existed and then said because he wasn't a racist. I think, he, I mean, I don't know if he actually thinks everybody has to be a racist, although he clearly doesn't understand implicit bias and could use a, a class. Um, but, you know, for, for him to think that it, it requires that everyone be a racist for systemic racism to exist blows me away that he could be an 18 year senator and not understand what systemic racism is. 90% of minority owned businesses not getting those PPP loans is not because of one racist person tw twisting their mustache and saying, ha, 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 I'm going to stop these minority owned businesses. It's, it's a system. It's an institution. It's, it's relationships with accountants and attorneys and, and, you know, networks. And, and, and it just goes beyond it's, it's, it's systems created um, or lack thereof to inform small business owners on how they can get PPP loans. I talk to minority owned businesses or business leaders all the time. And some of them say things like, I don't want to take out a PPP loan because I don't want to have, a, I'm, I, I don't like to have debt and I don't want to have a loan I have to repay. And then I want to get them access to information on how to have those loans forgiven. So it's just, it's, it's the system, it's the criminal justice system, it's access to small business capital, it's healthcare disparities, it's, you know, black women maternal mortality rate being sky high. I mean, we already have a maternal mortality rate problem in Texas, but it's so much worse for black women. So let's look at the, the healthcare disparities of underlying conditions that cause that and food deserts and lack of access to nutrition and, but also implicit bias in healthcare and, and not listening to mothers. And there's so much, too much to cover in this short amount of time, but that's how I define systemic racism. And I think that it's great that we're having conversations about policing reform and criminal justice reform, um, but we also need to acknowledge that those are symptoms of a bigger problem that we need to address. We need to address those, those problems with a, a lack of access to education and healthcare disparities and business capital. We need to undo the damage done by redlining and, and um, you know, the attacks on minority owned businesses that have made it difficult for those businesses and communities to thrive and really build that generational wealth for their families. Um, so. There's a lot to unpack there, I think, um, but you know, it's, it's work that we can do. Um, and I am so grateful to organizations like yours and for having forums like these and for even having conversations with people. I mean, I think, I think our values are aligned from what I can tell, um, but even I have conversations with folks that I, I don't necessarily agree with. And, and I think, you know, to speak to kind of some closing comments, um, I believe I'm going to be very effective as the next senator from Texas. And, and sometimes people say, well, you don't have any legislative experience. And I would argue that that is a good thing, um, that, that I don't know how much more of John Cornyn's experience we can stand here in Texas. Um, I think we need to have term limits because, frankly, if you're in D.C. for too long and you get experience, I think you start to become less effective at fighting for regular people. I have the experience that it takes to be effective. Um, working minimum wage jobs, struggling, worrying about where healthcare is coming from, worrying about whether or not social security is going to be there for me. I don't know if you mentioned that, or if, if you heard me mention that John Cornyn's on three taxpayer funded pensions right now, not coming to him after he retires, getting right now. Do you think he's ever lost a minute of sleep wondering if social security would be there for him? No, of course he's willing to risk privatizing social security. He doesn't care whether it fails. He just wants to fight for his corporate donors that want him to privatize it. So he's going to sabotage it as much as he can to make it fail so that he can make the argument to privatize it. Y'all, we are done listening to the BS and the smoke and mirrors and the snake oil salesman and the slick DC talk. We got to start holding people accountable. We got to start electing people who have our shared experiences and struggles and challenges, who have a proven track record of taking on really tough problems and fixing them. I haven't even been able to tell you about my time in DC as a private citizen fighting and building broad bipartisan coalitions. I've done it before, I can do it again. Stand with me and I will not go to DC and speak for you. I will speak to you and have you speak to me and I will hear you and listen and we will collaborate on solutions and I will take those solutions to DC and fight for them. Thank you so much. Well, we just wanna thank you once again um, 
for, for listening um, and responding to the questions, to the concerns, to the demands of, of poor and low income Texans, um, poor and low income Americans. Um, and again, as we, as we started out this program, we said that, you know, who holds the key to, to transforming the entire political landscape is poor and low income people. The 64 million eligible poor and low income voters in this nation who have the power, it's in our hands, and that's why the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival, is doing more. We're mobilizing, we're organizing, we're registering, and we're educating people for a movement that votes. And so we want to thank um, MJ Hager um, uh, profoundly and deeply for, for coming, for responding, for coming with policy solutions, um, uh, actual uh, solutions to the problems that people across Texas are facing. Um, we want to thank all of the leaders of the Texas Poor People's Campaign who have helped to pull this together and, and share their stories and share their demands and share their vision for a more just country, a more just Texas. And so we want to thank everybody for, for being with us, for tuning in. Um, as we say in the Poor People's Campaign, we're going to move forward together and not one step back. Hope that everyone has a safe uh, and, and good um, evening and afternoon, and uh, we'll see everybody uh, going to those polls um, between now and November 3rd. Uh, thank you so much, and have a great evening. Thank you. Stay safe, y'all. Thank you. Oh, yeah.